gentlemen, please welcome Frankie Boyle! And welcome to New World Order. This week, Tommy Robinson was sent to jail for 13 months, where he's currently trying to form the Anal Defence League <laughs> against strong opposition. <laughs> There's a lot of talk this week about a snap general election, maybe happening in October, and Michael Gove might be a stand-in Prime Minister. Michael Gove with his little oily face. <laughs> Looks like he'd fall through the hole in a massage table. <laughs> Looks like he could be killed with salt. <laughs> the idea is that Michael Gove would be a caretaker prime minister and Ruth Davidson would be his number two. The worst number two since the one that Tommy Robinson's been trying to do for the last few days <laughs> to dislodge a rolled up Quran. Some Russian DJs pranked Boris Johnson. Imagine pranking Boris. That's like playing a card trick on a coma patient. <laughs> in Ireland, in the referendum, the pro-choice people won, and well done to them. Before this, Irish women, a lot of them had to travel to Liverpool to have a termination, which is tragic, obviously, but at least it's poetic, because every time I hear a Scouse accent, a little something inside me dies. <laughs> now, it's just Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland is anti-choice in different ways right across the whole political spectrum. And the DUP are also homophobic. They're against gay marriage for religious reasons, which is ridiculous, because Jesus was gay. It says in the Bible, he rode an ass. <laughs> We're told that Prince William is to visit Israel and the West Bank is not the first member of the royal family to go over there, but he is the first one who isn't leading a crusade. <laughs> Apparently he's going to be meeting Benjamin Netanyahu. To me, that's one of the all-time great words in a Scottish accent. <laughs> Netanyahu. <laughs> Sounds like a really cheap Glaswegian internet package. <laughs> It's Israel's 70th anniversary, so William will be greeted with a 70-gun salute fired straight into some Palestinians. <laughs> First, there's a real reason that William's going. The real reason that he's going is to perform an occult duty for the royal family. He's going to have an asphyxi wank from the tree in Golgotha that Judas hung himself from. <laughs> A task that needs to be performed to allow Prince Philip's soul to leave this dimension. <laughs> OK, let's get on with the show. <laughs> Joining me tonight to discuss the week's big topics are Sarah Pascoe, Catherine Ryan and data journalist Mona Chalabay. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, you had a good week. I have been looking at the news. Mm -hmm. I have been looking at... Well, do you know what? Because I don't want to make you feel left out, but we've got um, a WhatsApp group. <laughs> <laughs> I but, couldn't feel more left out. <laughs> we don't have your phone number, so we can't add you. Give it to and me. also it's because we started off talking about how much we fancied a Carla. <gasps> Sarah, the I just number broke the rule. The WhatsApp. WhatsApp. <laughs> you did not say that. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I just broke the WhatsApp code. You can tell. So all we talk about on the WhatsApp is um, the news. The news. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the news that they've opened these menopause cafes. Have you seen these? What? Like the cat cafe? Kind of. We <laughs> can <laughs> stroke menopausal women. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. The idea is that you like open up a new dialogue about menopause. I'm all for talking more about menopause. I don't think we talk enough about menopause. I think we should just run into Starbucks and shout about it. <laughs> My vagina is so dry! <laughs> oh, have a latte. <laughs> okay. Our first motion tonight. <laughs> the Tory party will put a dying Breton out of its misery. <laughs> Brexit may transpire to have done the country a great service by keeping one of the most incompetent cabinets in history away from doing any actual governing. 
Theresa May's whole demeanour now is of a woman being blackmailed because her cleaner knows a dark secret and she's paying her off at the rate of 200 b &H a week. <laughs> I'm still struggling to work out whether Boris Johnson represents the interface of the public school system and fetal alcohol syndrome or what happens when Pixar is infiltrated by the last surviving Nazi war criminal. <laughs> I really do feel there's a kind of inhumanity to the Tory party. I mean, Corbyn, whatever you think of him, at least he seems to be a kind of real person. It's very hard to imagine a Tory MP digging an allotment, <laughs> except maybe to hide an au pair. <laughs> Joining us to discuss the Tories, please welcome Holly Walsh. How are you doing, Holly? Very good, thank you. Very good. You've been following the government, what they're up to? You can't not, can you? So they're everywhere. It's like they rule this place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've been reading about Brexit now for, what, like a year and a half. I do not understand pretty much any of it, which is what I've got in common with the government. So, uh... <laughs> They don't know what they're doing because when they had this vote in the first place, they didn't have a plan of what's going to happen. You know that bit at the end of the news where the newsreader would just shuffle the papers? <laughs> that, that, they've been doing that for a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> they're just filling time. I just, I quite like the dogged insistence of people. It's like you've ordered a pizza based on a rumour that you've heard about toppings. <laughs> <laughs> It turns up and it's covered in, like, pigeon shit and bits of <laughs> odour eaters and stuff. You're like, just stick it in my face anyway! <laughs> I ordered it! <laughs> yeah. I mean, the numbers don't really add up. It's like two-thirds of Brits don't think that we're going to get a good deal out of Brexit. But a lot of people are still supporting it regardless. I didn't think I'd find this as fascinating as I have, but the European Trade Union is such a reflection on how the government's going. So, for example, They've come up with all these variations and what they're going to do if we leave Europe. And Europe haven't agreed to any of it. It's like, I really fancy Idris Elba. I really want to have sex with Idris Elba. Do you want to join our WhatsApp? <laughs> <laughs> will I have sex with him in my car or will I have sex with him in my hotel room? The big problem with all this is that Idris Elba doesn't want to have sex with me. I can get a, loads of lawyers in, we can talk about all the ways we can have sex, how great the sex is going to be. It doesn't matter if the person who you're trying to make the deal with isn't interested and that's exactly what we've done with, with Brexit. <laughs> I like Brexit because I like to mix things up and it's got me supporting things I used to hate. I'm shouting things like, go House of Lords, and everybody shut up and listen to Nick Clegg. <laughs> well, with your, you know, will the government put us out of our misery? I feel like we haven't even got into our misery yet. We're still in a big, long traffic jam, queuing up to find out what misery is like at the moment. It's rubbish. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Theresa May continues to stagger through the leadership of the party. Here's May doing her best to fend off ITV's probing questions about how she lets her hair down. If you could have your perfect get-together with your girlfriends on International Women's Day, away from all of the pressures of your job, what would be your perfect night with them and how would you let your hair down? Oh, goodness me. I mean, what a, what a question. And I hadn't thought about it because actually my International Women's Day is heavily focused on what we're doing on domestic abuse. But just so naturally. it's not going to have the time to have the girls round and have an evening together, I know, I'm afraid. I that That's a rather different you, situation. I'm just saying on your dream moment, how would you let your hair down with your girlfriends? Well, there's... I don't think that when you let your hair down, I don't think there's only one way of doing it. I think it depends on the group that you've got, it depends on the time. But as I say, there's, my International Women's Day is rather more focused not on what we can do to enjoy ourselves, but actually on what we can do to help women out there, women who are suffering, women who are being abused and whose lives are being made a daily living hell. <laughs> <laughs> to laugh someone's asked what's your perfect girls night in and you end with the words a daily living hell <laughs> i like that answer i think yeah. it's an unfair question yeah was she going to tell the truth i take half of vicodin and look at my tupperware collection <laughs> <laughs> i thought in the second stage of it you could see running through her mind she got i can't say fields of wheat <laughs> I, um, I really sympathise with her. I think it's one of those questions where it's a bit of a trick question. She's like, I don't have any good stories, so I'm going to avoid this. She seems gone, though. She seems like 
Not that you find a mortally wounded animal at the side of the road. <laughs> I think if that presenter had gone out to the boot of her car and come back with a tire iron <laughs> and beat her to death, <laughs> two thirds of Theresa May's personalities would have felt relieved. <laughs> Theresa May is really persistent. People keep saying she's weak. All of Britain just wants her to stop messing up and talking, but she won't stop. Aren't we trying to normalise her a little? I mean, she looks like she'd pull a child into a black and white photo. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's true about the International Women's Day thing. It, it isn't like a party day. It's because of FGM and stuff. It's yeah. like, oh, no, just an excuse to get together. Let your hair down. <laughs> No, but her response wasn't, this is what we need to talk about because this is what's important. She genuinely couldn't think of a single friend. Yes, yeah, she could. Yeah. She couldn't. Oh, yeah, but she's, she's busy. busy. No. She's busy. Maybe like, a lot of her friends have been killed like the two women in Britain a week by domestic abuse. Yeah. <laughs> but that was actually part of an interview where she refused to guarantee funding for women's refuges. Yeah, she's tricksy. Yeah. She's tricksy like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were talking about repeal the eighth, which has happened in Ireland, which is so fantastic. But now Northern Ireland, obviously, British women should be extended the same rights, but her relationship with the DUP means it's impossible. Mm. And she's now really skirting this issue of if she's even a feminist, because there's this basic human rights issue that her political alliance means she can't even talk about. And I wonder she's sad. She's got a tough job. I mean, I think it's the worst time in 70 years to be a British Prime Minister, and she wants that job. I don't. There is something a little alien about, you know, the whole kind of Tory cabinet, isn't there? Yeah, it's Jeremy Hunt. I don't know how, unless you are getting off on it, <laughs> can do the things that he's doing to the NHS. Yeah, but at least he is one of the few Tories who has a plan and is carrying no, it out. No, no, he said really, really recently that the NHS isn't in crisis. How on earth he could possibly utter those words is petrifying. No, but I mean, that's what he's doing. He's just taking apart the NHS. Like, that's his plan and he's carrying it out and he's going to get it done. I sort of wonder if Jeremy Hunt gets abused so much in the street that he just kind of tunes it out. You know, like someone who lives beside a, a railway track. Maybe he can't get to sleep without it. Oh. Darling, could you call me an arsehole for 20 minutes till I drop off? <laughs> Anyway, the Tories are deeply divided, especially by Brexit. Since the decision to leave, backbenchers like Jacob Rees-Mogg have become more vocal. A young Rees-Mogg was interviewed by Radio 4 in 1981 and asked what motivates him. Here's his troubling response. Lamani. I like Lamani. And also, it's very pleasing if you get it right and they go up. What do you do with the money then? Well, I either reinvest it or buy antiques. Antique silver. Oh, well, I hope to have the job at GEC by the time I'm 30, unless it is nationalised, which no doubt if Tony Benn gets it, he'll poof, and ruin the rest of the country as well, but never mind. Conservatives will come back and put it right. It's like the sort of voice you'd hear trying to lure you into a well. <laughs> I just think the danger is everyone just thinks he's a cartoon character yeah. that isn't real, because that's what we all thought with Trump, and it turns out, like, he's a real person. Yeah. Well, he sort of is a cartoon character, and like a lot of Tories, he's kind of developed a personality mm. through trying to lure his father out from behind the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> no. You know? Please, please love me. <laughs> he's power mad. If David Cameron would allegedly put his penis in a pig, this guy would wank off a giraffe to get... <laughs> 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 it's weird because he's got like six kids and he mm. seems such an asexual. Oh. <laughs> so, and he's got the same nanny, hasn't he? It's my favourite fact about him. Oh, yeah. So, his nanny who brought him up is now his children's nanny and oh. still lives in the same house. Oh my God. So it is a completely different existence. She's yeah, still his nanny. <laughs> no, she. she what's, what's really creepy is she died 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that's weird is that May, even though she's deeply unpopular right now, she's still more popular than Corbyn, even despite all of the handling of this. So there was, like, polls that asked on specific, like, leadership traits. So, like, she's more likely to be considered a capable leader, more likely to be considered good in a crisis, more likely to be considered...
considered as having sound judgment and understands the problems facing Britain. She just beats Corbyn on all of those measures. But why is Corbyn behind her? Is it like media framing? Labour get very little screen time. Mm, yeah. Well, I think it's a deeper thing than that. I think it's partly about how politics has become so tribal now and each of the respective parties kind of has their own demographic group that looks very different. So again, like two thirds of people in this country who are over 70 are Tory voters, whereas two thirds of those under 24 are Labour voters. Like the age is like this big, big mm. divide. They're not even trying to appeal to these different groups because that's not who they need. No. Boris Johnson remains a big problem for me. Here he is on the Today programme offering his baffling take on the problem of a hard Irish border. There's no border between um, um, Islington or Camden and Westminster. There's no border between Camden and, and Westminster. But when I was mayor of London, we, we anaesthetically and invisibly took hundreds of millions of pounds from the accounts of people travelling between uh, those two boroughs without any need for uh, border checks, whatever. There are Come all on, sorts of things. Come on, you can't compare two boroughs of, of London with the kinds of difference in, in the arrangements that would, that would be in place no, I after think, Brexit I think, between I think, the UK I think and it's the a very, EU. it's a very relevant comparison. <laughs> Because we all remember the troubles between Camden and Islington. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing that he's saying that like, we charge people from going from one to one, obviously with oyster cars on the tube. It doesn't mention like the millions who just walked freely throughout the boroughs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, if some of those people who were walking had rocket launchers and firm views on Irish history. <laughs> I think Britain's really forgotten quite how feisty the people of Northern Ireland can be. <laughs> you know. I did a gig there a couple of years ago that there was a, there was a boycott and a mm. picket and stuff, right, an, an occupational hazard. So two people turn up to meet me from the boat to take me into the gig and one of them is like a, like a heavyweight boxer, he looks like, or something, right? And he comes up to me and goes, uh, I'm an advisor. Right? <laughs> and my support act is quite a jolly character. He went, uh, oh, what, what would you say if I said you look like something a wee bit more than an advisor? He went, I'd advise you to shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> so, in conclusion, here at the show, we've been leaked the minutes of the last cabinet meeting. Exciting stuff. And we've had it confirmed that these are absolutely genuine. The meeting commences when Philip Hammond coughs the skull of a robin against an ancient bell. <laughs> the members of the cabinet form a writhing sex knot. The cabinet secretary's job is to occasionally step in and untangle them like headphones. <laughs> David Davis sips slowly from a hip flask of medical grade heroin. He is unaware that he is urinating. <laughs> Raising the pension age is proposed by a figure that ancient Babylonians would have understood as both death and shame through the twitching, palsied lips of Michael Gove. <laughs> Chris Grayling French kisses an owl so hard it takes 15% off the minimum wage. <laughs> Boris Johnson is late. When he finally manifests, he anchors himself by knotting his foreskin to a table leg. <laughs> Jeremy Hunt's face changes to that of Britain's last hanging victim, and black crystal tears fall from his eyes and shatter on the desk as he receives instructions from the lingerie-clad skeleton of Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> now a mid-ranking concubine in hell. <laughs> but of course, all the really interesting stuff is redacted. Thanks to Holly! Next up, all social media will achieve is to cause the aliens who find our remains to hate us. <laughs> Before I saw how people can connect on social media, I thought climate collapse and nuclear war were inevitable. Now, I welcome them with open arms. <laughs> I suppose I'm too old for a lot of apps, really. During the five minutes my photo was up on Tinder, I was left swiped so often I now have whiplash due to voodoo. <laughs> My Facebook was recently taken over by a malicious sex predator when I remembered my password. <laughs> Joining us to discuss social media, please welcome Jack Carroll! <laughs> How are you doing, Jack? Not too bad, man. I'm good. It's nice to be here. 
Are you on social media? You got Facebook and stuff? Yeah, I am. I prefer Facebook to Twitter because I would rather get a happy birthday message from someone who didn't mean it than a death threat from someone who did. <laughs> I get a lot of death threats and hatred and stuff sometimes, on and off. Depends on what I've been up to. But I mistakenly said to my daughter, because I have the police coming by on Friday. She said, well, why are they coming? I said, oh, someone says they're going to hurt me, but they won't. She said, how do you know? I said, because if someone wants to kill you, they don't tell you first, they just kill you. And that was not the right thing to say. <laughs> I find it, I mean, I do find it depressing, but I wonder sometimes, is what I hate social media or is it people, you know? <laughs> is it that the worst side of people is coming out on there or is it just a, a really unhealthy place to be? I think that's it. I think, like, social media is inherently a good idea that's fallen into bad hands. A bit like Jeremy Clarkson presenting who wants to be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, as we evolve as a culture, hopefully the way we use the technology will evolve. My thing with social media isn't that it's the people... I think it's a mirror. I think we see the things we don't like about ourselves in others. My dad used to say, that guy's got something I just can't stand about me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Is his wife. <laughs> <laughs> now, being online allows us to stay up to date with all the crucial news we need to know, as demonstrated here by Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey. So I see trends right away, and trends show exactly what's happening right now in the world. And why that's interesting and why I bring up the weather is it tells me what I'm going to be talking about when I get into work. Beyonce just released an album. I'm going to be talking a lot about Beyonce. All my coworkers are going to be talking about Beyonce. They're going to be thinking about Beyonce. Um, they're going to be tweeting about Beyonce. And uh, my family and my friends, they're going to know that Beyonce happened. And now I know too, uh, because I saw it on Twitter and it, it makes me smarter. <laughs> You said all my co-workers are going to be talking about Beyonce. Have these people not got jobs to do? <laughs> I still feel he doesn't know what Beyonce is, though. Mm -hmm. Like, he just leans into a cubicle and goes, Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> I read recently that uh, social media hijacks the same dopamine reward systems as hard drugs. Now, I can't imagine getting away with that at Narcotics Anonymous. Oh, well. At the height of my addiction, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was sending out three or four Candy Crush requests a day. <laughs> I even contemplated taking my own life. It wouldn't have mattered, I've got three left. <laughs> there, there have honestly been efforts, though, to classify it as an addiction. And yeah. internet addiction is relatively recognised, but not social media addiction mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. But it's people who tend to feel more lonely and isolated might be more likely to be using social media mm -hmm. in the first place. OK, then. Many early websites have since developed into powerful global companies. And only now are we stopping to ask what damage they might be causing. Here's a former Facebook executive calmly discussing his fears for the future. I feel tremendous guilt. Um, I, think we, I think we all knew in the back of our minds, even though we feigned this whole line of like, there probably aren't any really bad unintended consequences. I think in the back, deep, deep recesses of our minds, we, we kind of knew something bad could happen. If you feed the beast, that beast will destroy you. If you push back on it, we have a chance to control it and rein it in. Like, that is the start of a disaster movie, that, that we've just watched. Yeah. Mm. Don't feed the beast. Yeah. And the beast <laughs> is that, I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> I think we use extinction as a comfort blanket when really the more harrowing truth is that a thousand years from now, this exact same thing will continue. <laughs> <laughs> Children do need to be told that when you post something, you're not just posting. We shouldn't use the word post. I'm posting. You're publishing. Mm -hmm. Imagine publishing a sexy photo when you're 14. I mean, that's That illegal. is when you look your best, though. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 It'd be great I, if that was the joke that got us shut down. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Companies continue to find new ways to capture every detail of our lives. We've even invited Google and Amazon into our homes to monitor and record every word we say. Let's play Digger Digger. Bobby, can you talk to play wheels? You want to box? hear a station for porn detected. Porno ringtone, no. hot chick, amateur girl, quarry, no. sexy. No, 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 no! no. <laughs> Alexa, stop! <laughs> <laughs> <What>? <laughs> you, you only get that 
type of laugh when your entire internet history has been read out in front of you. <laughs> I think what a creepy way to find out your dad's sexual preferences to be told them by a robot. <laughs> that they had like a big family gathering and the kid was saying goodbye to everyone and at the end the kid waved and said bye Alexa like they didn't understand that it wasn't a person wow that scared me a bit but also I shouldn't be scared because technology is neither good nor bad but you know <laughs> social media has left traditional news unable to compete here's one amateur showing us the kind of informative and explosive reporting we can look forward to in the future we on the scene of this bitch attention waving new this is building y'all reporting live I'm reporting live, I'm a volunteer. Wavy TV 10 is not on the scene, but Rhoda Young is on the scene. This is Rhoda Young reporting live. This guy right here, it is his house that is burning down. He do not know how the house caught a fire, but he was coming from the store with a six pack of red, blue, and white ribbon beer. <laughs> Everybody stay clear, we got electrical wires coming down. Oh, shit! <laughs> Once again, that's the owner. Drunk as a motherfucker. <laughs> Everybody is really mad at me. I don't know why. <laughs> this guy right here, he just looked at me and rolled his eyes. I really wish she'd been on this scene at 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's going to change things, though, isn't it? Because, like, previously, we have on the news, we have the passive voice, mm. you know, as so they talk about, you know, bombs fall on Yemen as if they're falling as naturally as rain. Mm. What are they falling out of? We don't know. Mm. And, you know, with, with social media, at least we're going to, going to get a, a more subjective voice. I mean, how is Hugh Edwards going to compete with that? <laughs> and the news also never has, like, a font round it saying thankful. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to find out that that was actually fake and was just a viral marketing campaign for that brand of beer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's what I was waiting for. Yeah. The beer you drink when your house is burnt. <laughs> <laughs> so, in conclusion, the future, as I once whispered into the ear of a fisherman as I heaved him into the sea from the end of Clacton Pier, can be unpredictable. <laughs> Our political system isn't worried about the internet's potential for data mining, targeted advertising and platforming racists. It sees those things as the future of mainstream politics. Many people who would class themselves as online activists rarely leave the house, so their observations on society are based simply on memes, freeview TV and watching their bodies fungal spores at war. <laughs> That's the end of the show. Thanks to my guests, Sarah Pascoe, Catherine Ryan, Mona Chalaby, Holly Walsh and Jack Carroll! <laughs> but before I go, I'd like to leave you with this thought. I think I get less interested in sex as I get less capable of having sex. <laughs> I couldn't lift a woman up against a wall anymore. Well, it depends on the wall. But it's very few women's sexual fantasy to be jackknifed over a garden wall. <laughs> your options narrow a lot at 45. Really, you're reduced to dating people you've dated in the past. The sexual equivalent of eating out of the bin. <laughs> this is why I'm interested in the development of sex robots. I've always thought that every robot is a sex robot if your attitude is right. <laughs> I'm not saying that sex robots won't have problems, even now. I find it difficult to get Alexa to understand my safe word in a Scottish accent. <laughs> a lot of people think that sex robots will put an end to prostitution, that they'll be a good thing. I don't think that's how capitalism works. I think instead of a woman earning good money as a prostitute, that same woman will earn minimum wage cleaning out the cum grates of a hundred sex robots. <laughs> until she's replaced by a machine. That's capitalism, trickle-down economics. <laughs> I think sex robots will be quite cheap. The upgrades, that's where they'll get you. You'll be walking home and see a queue outside the Apple shop because they've launched a new arsehole. <laughs> or they'll make their money through advertising. At the moment of orgasm, the sex robot will grab you by the back of the neck and say, buy an Audi. <laughs> And you'll think about buying an advertising free sex robot, but you won't be able to afford to because you'll own nine Audis. <laughs> the first time someone ejaculates inside a sex robot, they will feel a unique loneliness that will provide a challenge to country music. 
I've never missed you more than when I came in a robot's hair. 